Hello, everyone. For this stream, I'm going to try something different. I'm going to try reading an actual book, like an actual, actual book, not just a light novel. Does anyone ever read books anymore? I feel like I used to when I was younger. I read a lot of books. But then, you know, I got video games, I got internet, got comics, got all that stuff that's more fun, so I kind of stopped reading books. But I want to get back into it again. This book, Norwegian Wood, by pretty famous. If, you, uh, if you're at all into books, you've probably heard of it. Although I feel like there's a lot of people that aren't into books that haven't heard of it. It's a, it's a book about this, this guy like reminiscing on his experiences as a college student in 1960s Japan. I started reading it today. I went to a park and just sat under a tree by myself and read. I think that's an interesting experience because it, it cuts you off from the outside world, from distractions kind of what I have to do. You should try it sometime if you haven't. Just cut yourself off from all distractions and try to focus on something slower like, the, like that. Anyway, I'm going to skip ahead. Sorry. I'm going to just skip to where I am, and you can read the first part of it yourself. It's not a... Uh, you're not missing any. It's The plot isn't really the important thing about this book, I think. Sorry, I'm really skipping a lot here. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, to get you up to speed, so there's the main character uh, named Watanabe, who, like I said, um, he starts out at age 39 or something, and he's remembering his experiences as a college student um, back in 1969 in Japan. So there's a lot of um, tropes about like hippies and college students and political protests and that sort of thing that you'd expect from the 1960s. Almost feels like an American hippie type story. The main character, uh, he has this male friend, Nagasawa, who's kind of a Chad. They're not really close, but he just hangs out with this guy. He's closer to two female characters named, uh, one named Naoko, who was the girlfriend of his friend that died. So he's like, he had this friend that committed suicide and he's haunted by that. And then he had, he's met this other girl recently named Midori, who's a little more cheery. Uh, and right now the main character is feeling sad about for some reason, because the girl wouldn't hang out with them or something. So he's going to go out with his guy friend and try to meet girls. Nagasawa came to my room that Saturday afternoon and suggested we have one of our nights on the town. He would arrange an overnight pass for me. I said I would go. I had been feeling especially muddled-headed for the past week and was ready to sleep with anybody. It didn't matter who. <laughs> so, <laughs> guys make, are so easy, I guess. Late in the afternoon, I showered and shaved and put on fresh clothes, a polo shirt and cotton jacket, then had dinner with Nagasawa in the, ha in the dining hall, and the two of us caught a bus to Shinjuku. We walked around a lively area for a while, then went to our, one of our usual bars and sat there waiting for a lengthy pair of girls. The girls tended to come in pairs to this bar, except on this particular evening. We stayed there almost two hours, sipping whiskey and sodas at a rate that kept us sober. Two hours? Man. It's a long time to wait. Finally, two friendly-looking girls took seats at the bar, ordering a gimlet and a margarita. Okay, so, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. I'm going to interrupt a lot. This will be like half the book and half just my random thoughts about it. Would they really order a margarita in 1960s Japan? I mean, granted, this is like a really trendy area in Tokyo, but I'm, I'm wondering if that was real or if that's just like exaggeration by the translator to make it easier for us to understand. Eh, it might be real. I don't know, because I have no idea. Anyway, Nagasawa approached them straight away, but they said they were waiting for their boyfriends. Still, all the four of us enjoyed a pleasant chat until their dates showed up. Nagasawa took me to another bar to try our luck, a small place in a kind of cul-de-sac where most of the customers were already drunk and noisy. A group of three girls occupied a table at the back. We joined them and enjoyed a little conversation, the five of us getting into a nice mood. Man, 
guys makes it sound so easy to meet girls. Like, this was not my experience in college at all. <laughs> Even just getting this far would have been amazing. But when Nagasawa suggested we go somewhere else for a drink, the girls said it was almost curfew time and they had to go back to their dorms. Yeah, you gotta bounce to a different venue. So much for our luck. We tried one more place with the same result. For some reason, the girls were just not coming our way. It's so funny the way this is like a mix of like uh, trendy sitcom, like friends, sex in the city sort of thing of like picking up girls at a trendy bar. But then on the other hand, they're also like, oh, curfew time, got to go back to the dorm. <laughs> Just this mix of adult and juvenile behavior, I guess. At 1130, Nagasawa was ready to give up. Sorry, I dragged you around for nothing, he said. No problem, I said. It was worth it to me just to see you have your off days sometimes, too. Maybe once a year, he admitted. Man, such a chat. Only once a year does he fail to pick up chicks. <laughs> In fact, I didn't care about getting laid anymore. Wandering around Shinjuku on a noisy Saturday night, observing the mysterious energy created by a mixture of sex and alcohol, I began to feel that my own desire was a puny thing. Where are you going now, Atanabe? Maybe go to an all-nighter, I said. I haven't seen a film in ages. I'll be going to Hatsumi's then, said Nagasawa. That's Nagasawa's actual girlfriend. He's picking up chicks despite having a girlfriend, because that's the kind of guy he is. Do you mind? No way, I said. Why should I mind? If you'd like, I could introduce you to a girl who'd let you spend the night. What are you... How is, I, how is that possible? How does it work like that for some people? They just like, oh, I could just introduce you to a girl at, in the middle of the night. <laughs> nah, I really am in the mood for a film. Sorry, said Nagasawa. I'll make it up to you sometime. And he disappeared into the crowd. I went into a fast food place for a cheeseburger and some coffee to kill the buzz, then went to see The Graduate in an old rep house. I didn't think it was all that good, but I didn't have anything better to do, so I stayed and watched it again, man. Be weird to see the same movie twice in a row. I don't think I've ever done that. Emerging from the cinema at four in the morning, I wandered along the chilly streets of Shinjuku, thinking. When I tired of walking, I went to an all-night cafe and waited with a book and a cup of coffee for the morning trains to start. Before long, the place became crowded with people who, like me, were waiting for those first trains. A waiter came to ask me apologetically if I would mind sharing my table. I said it would be all right. It didn't matter to me who sat across from me. I was just reading a book. My companions at the table turned out to be two girls. They looked about my age. Man, this guy has all the luck. Like, how lucky is that? Come on. That wouldn't happen. Should be like a random homeless guy. Or like... Whatever. Anyway. Neither of them was a knockout, but they weren't bad. Both were reserved in the way they dressed and made up. They were definitely not the type to be wandering around Shinjuku at five in the morning. I guess they had just happened to miss the last train. They seemed relieved to sit with me. I was neatly dressed, had shaved in the evening, and to cap it all, I was absorbed in Thomas Mons' The Magic Mountain. Is that how you get girls by reading weird literary novels at five in the morning? <laughs> I should try that, I guess. One of the girls was on the large side. She wore a gray parker and white jeans, carrying a large vinyl pocketbook, and had large shell-shaped earrings. Her friend was a small girl with glasses. She wore a blue cardigan over a checked shirt and had a turquoise ring. The smaller one had a habit of taking off her glasses and pressing her ears with their fingertips. Both girls ordered café au lait, ooh, fancy, and cake, which it took them some time to consume as they carried on what seemed like a serious discussion in hushed tones. The large girl t tilted her head several times, while the small one shook hers just as often. I couldn't make out what they were saying because of the loud stereo playing Marvin Gaye or the Bee Gees or something. But it seemed the small girl was angry or upset and the large girl was trying to comfort her. I alternated passages of my book with glances in their direction. Clutching her shoulder bag to her breast, the small girl went to the ladies, at which point her companion spoke to me. I'm sorry to bother you, but I wonder if you might know of any bars in the neighborhood that would still be serving drinks? Taken off guard, I set my book aside and asked, After five in the morning? Yes. If you ask me, at 5.20 in the morning, most people are on their way home to get sober and go to bed. Yes, I realize that, she said, a bit embarrassed, but my friend says she has to have a drink. It's kind of important. 
Would that really happen? I think your friend is an alcoholic. <laughs> There's probably nothing much you can do but go home and have a drink. But I have to catch a 7.30 train to Nagano. Well, that's another good reason to not be drinking at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> so find a vending machine and a nice place to sit. It's about all you can do. I know this is asking a lot, but could you come with us? Two girls alone really can't do something like that. It's mean character. Come on. <laughs> so easy. All right. I had had a number of unusual experiences in Shinjuku, but I had never before been invited to have a drink with two strange girls at 5.20 in the morning. Refusing would have been more trouble than it was worth, and time was no problem. Don't act like you don't want to go. Come on. <laughs> So I bought an armload of sake and snacks from a nearby machine, and the three of us went to an empty car park by the west exit of the station to hold an impromptu drinking party. The girls told me they had become friends working at a travel agency. Both of them had graduated from college this year and started their first jobs. The small one had a boyfriend she had been seeing for a year, but had been recently discovered he was sleeping with another girl and she had taken it hard. The large one was supposed to have left for the mountains of Nagano last night for her boyfriend's wedding, but she had decided to spend the night with her depressed friend and take the first express on Sunday morning. It's too bad what you're going through, I said to the small one. But how did you find out your boyfriend was sleeping with someone else? Taking little sips of sake, the girl tore at some weeds underfoot. I didn't have to work anything out, she said. I opened his door and there he was doing it. Oh no, NTR. I'm sorry, I shouldn't make fun of it. That would actually really suck. When was that? The night before last. Yeah, that's why she's drinking at 5 30 a.m. No way. The door was unlocked? Right. Wonder why he didn't lock it. What the hell should I know? Yeah, how's she supposed to feel, said the larger one, who seemed truly concerned for her friend. What a shock it must have been for her. Don't you think it's terrible? I really can't say, I answered. Uh, you could just say it's terrible. You ought to have a good talk with your boyfriend. Then it's a question of whether you forgive him or not. You could just say it's terrible. Nobody knows how I feel, spat out the little one, still tearing grass. I think the I think the, the implication is the main character is kind of emotionally dead inside because um, of what happened in the early part where his best friend committed suicide. The main character just, like, doesn't feel normal human emotions anymore, at least not too strongly. A flock of crows appeared from the west and sailed over a big department store. It was daylight now. The time for the train to Nagano was approaching, so we gave what was left of the sake to a homeless guy downstairs at the west exit. Yeah, that's a good plan. Waste not a want not. Bought platform tickets and went in to see the big girl off. After the train pulled out of sight, the small girl and I somehow ended up going to a nearby hotel. Of course she did. Neither of us was particularly dying to sleep with the other, but it seemed necessary to bring things to a close. <laughs> it's just the, just the polite thing to do. Don't really want to, but, you know, just have to. I undressed first and sat in the bath, drinking beer with a vengeance. He got in with me and did the same. The two of us stretched out in guzzling beer in silence. We couldn't seem to get drunk, though. Neither of us was sleepy. Have you ever, sorry to sidetrack this, but anyone listening, when you, have you ever had a long night partying and then you're like still drinking at, what time is this, like 7 a.m. or something? It's a weird experience to like still be up and still be drinking and still not as drunk as it seems like you should be. I've only experienced that a few times, but I kind of know what he's feeling. Her skin was very fair and smooth, and she had beautiful legs. I complimented her on her legs, but her thanks was little more than a grunt. Once we were in bed, though, she was like a different person. She responded to the slightest touch of my hands, writhing and moaning. Lude! When I went inside her, yeah, very lewd. She, when I went inside her, she dug her nails into my back, and as her orgasm approached, she called out another man's name exactly 16 times. I concentrated on counting them as a way to delay my own orgasm. Then the two of us fell asleep. Does it count as NTR when she's calling out the name of her boyfriend that she just broke up with two days ago? And you've never... 
Sorry, I shouldn't make fun of that. That's actually a pretty pity scene. She was gone when I woke at 12.30. I found no note of any kind. One set of my head felt strangely heavy from having drunk in an odd hour. I took a shower to wake myself, shaved and sat in a chair, naked, drinking a bottle of juice from the fridge and reviewing in order the nights, the events of the night before. Each scene felt unreal and strangely distant, as though I were viewing it through two or three layers of glass. But the events had undoubtedly happened to me. The beer glasses were still sitting on the table, and a used toothbrush lay by the sink. I ate a light lunch in Shinjuku and went to a telephone box to call Midori Kobayashi. That's his, uh, another girl that he's friends with. Just So far, just friends, although he did kiss her once on the off chance that she might be home alone waiting for a call today. I let it ring 15 times, but no one answered. I guess this was before they invented answering machines. I tried again 20 minutes later with the same results. Then I took a bus back to the dorm. A special delivery letter was waiting for me in the letterbox by the entry. It was from Naoko. That's, uh, that's this girl that he was friends with in high school who was... She was the girlfriend of his of his friend that committed suicide, and she's really messed up from that even more than she is. Dai Gosho, Chapter 5 Thanks for your letter, wrote Naoko. Her family had forwarded it here, she said. Far from upsetting her, its arrival had made her very happy, and in fact she had been on the point of writing to me herself. Having read that much, I opened the window, took off my jacket, and sat on the bed. I could hear pigeons cooing in a nearby roost. The breeze stirred the curtains, holding the seven pages of writing paper from Naoko. I gave myself up to an endless stream of feelings. It seemed as if the colors of the real world around me had begun to drain away from my having done nothing more than read a few lines she had written. I closed my eyes and spent a long time collecting my thoughts. Finally, after one deep breath, I continued reading. It's almost four months since I came here, she went on. I've thought a lot about you in that time. The more I've thought, the more I've come to feel that I was unfair to you. I probably should have been a better, fairer person when it came to the way I treated you. This may not be the most normal way to look at things, though. Girls my age never use the word fair. I think they use that word a lot, although their opinion on what's fair is probably different from what my opinion is as a guy. Ordinary girls as young as I am are basically indifferent to whether things are fair or not. The central question for them is not whether something is fair, but whether or not it's beautiful or will make them feel them make them feel happy. I'll just no comment. Fair is a man's word, finally, but I can't help feeling that it is also exactly the right word for me now. And because questions of beauty and happiness have become such difficult and convoluted propositions for me now, I suspect, I find myself clinging instead to other standards, like whether or not something is fair or honest or universally true. In any case, though, I believe that I have not been fair to you, and that, as a result, I must have led you around in circles and hurt you deeply. In doing so, however, I have led myself around in circles and hurt myself just as deeply. I say this not as an excuse or a means of self-justification, but because it is true. If I have left a wound inside you, it is not just your wound, but mine as well. So please try not to hate me. I am a flawed human being, a far more flawed human being than you realize, which is precisely why I do not want you to hate me. Because if you were to do that, I would really go to pieces. I can't do what you can do. I can't slip inside my shell and wait for things to pass. I don't know for a fact that you are really like that, but sometimes you give me that impression. I often envy that in you, which may be why I led you around in circles so much. This may be an overly analytical way of looking at things. Don't you agree? The therapy they perform here, she's staying in a hospital slash mental ward right now. The therapy they perform here is certainly not over analytical, but when you are under treatment for several months the way I am here, like it or not, you become more or less analytical. This was caused by that, and that means this, because of which such and such, like that. I can't tell whether this kind of analysis is trying to simplify the world or complicate it. Yeah, I think she's just stuck in her head with no one to talk to and no social contact. That's that's what happens when you don't when you get isolated for a long time. 
start overthinking things. In any case, I myself feel that I am far closer to recovery than I once was. People tell me this is true. This is the first time in a long while I've been able to sit down and calmly write a letter. The one I wrote you in July was something I had to squeeze out of me. Though, to tell you the truth, I don't remember what I wrote. Was it terrible? But this time I am very, very calm. Clean air, a quiet world cut off from the outside, a daily schedule for living, regular exercise. Those are what I needed, it seems. Yeah, it seems like good for anybody to have those good, healthy lifestyle. How wonderful it is to be able to write someone a letter, to feel like conveying your thoughts to a person, to sit at your desk and pick up a pen, to put your thoughts into words like this is truly marvelous. Of course, once I do put them into words, I find I can only express a fraction of what I want to say. But that's all right. I'm happy just to be able to feel I want to write to someone. And so I am writing to you. It's 7.30 in the evening. I've had my dinner and I've just finished my bath. The place is silent and it's pitch black outside. I can't see a single light through the window. I usually have a clear view of the stars from here, but not today with the clouds. Everyone here knows a lot about the stars, and they tell me, that's Virgo, or that's Sagittarius. They probably learn whether they want to or not, because there's nothing to do here once the sun goes down. <laughs> oh yeah, this is life before, before smartphones, or before computers. Like, oh, sun goes down. <laughs> Nothing to do. <laughs> Stare at the stars. <laughs> that would be boring. Which is also why they know so much about birds and flowers and insects. Speaking to them, I realize how ignorant I was about such things, which is kind of nice. There are about 70 people living here. In addition, the staff, doctors, nurses, office staff, etc., come in to just over 20. It's such a wide open place. These are not big numbers at all. Far from it. It might be more accurate to say the place is on the empty side. It's big and filled with nature, and everybody lives quietly. So quietly, you sometimes feel that this is the normal, real world, which, of course, it's not. We can have it this way because we live here under certain preconditions. I play tennis and basketball. Basketball teams are made up of both staff and, I hate the word, but there's no way around it, patients. She's a patient. She is insane. When I'm absorbed in a game, though, I lose track of who are the patients and who are staff. This is kind of strange. I know this will sound strange, but when I look at the people around me during the game, they all look equally deformed. Yeah, basketball makes you crazy. Don't play basketball. I said this one day to the doctor in charge of my case, and he told me that, in a sense, what I was feeling was right. That we are in here not to correct the deformation, but to accustom ourselves to it that one of our problems was our inability to recognize and accept our own deformities. Just as each person has certain idiosyncrasies in the way he or she walks, people have idiosyncrasies in the way they think and feel and say things. And though you might want to correct them, it doesn't happen overnight. And if you try to force the issue in one case, someone else might go funny. He gave me a very simplified explanation, of course. And it's just one small part of the problems we have. But I think I understand what he was trying to say. It may well be that we can never fully adapt to our own deformities, unable to find a place inside ourselves for the very real pain and suffering that these deformities cause. We come here to get away from such things. As long as we are here, we can get by without hurting others or being hurt by them because we know we, we are deformed. That's what distinguishes us from the outside world. Most people go about their lives unconscious of their deformities, while in this little world of ours, the deformities themselves are a precondition. Just as Indians wear feathers on their head to show what tribe they belong to. It's kind of... We wear our deformities in their open, and we live quietly so as not to hurt one another. In addition to playing sports, we all participate in growing vegetables, tomatoes, aubergines, I don't know what an aubergine is, Cucumbers, watermelons, strawberries, spring onions, cabbage, daikon rubbishes, and so on. We grow just about everything. We use greenhouses, too. The people here know a lot about vegetable farming, and they put a lot of energy into it. I guess that's what you do, and there's nothing else to do, because you're in an insane asylum in the 60s. <laughs> they read books on the subject and call in experts and talk from morning to night about which fertilizer to use and the condition of the soil and stuff like that. I have come to love growing vegetables. It's great to watch different fruits and vegetables getting bigger and bigger each day. 
Have you grown watermelons? They swell up just like some kind of animals. Yeah, uh, yeah, growing vegetables is fun, but you should try playing video games sometimes. We eat freshly picked fruits and vegetables every day. They also serve meat and fish, of course, but when you're living here, you feel less and less like eating those because the vegetables are so fresh and delicious. Huh. Sounds amazing. Sometimes we go out and gather wild plants and mushrooms. We have experts in that kind of thing. Come to think of it, this place is crawling with experts who tell us which plants to pick and which to avoid. As a result of all this, I've gained over six pounds since I got here. Uh, you make it sound like that's a good thing. Congratulations on gaining weight by all the wild plants that you gathered. That girl must have been really skinny to start with. My weight is just about perfect, thanks to the exercise and the good eating on a regular schedule. Yeah, uh, guessing that this 1960s Japanese woman has a different sense of perspective on body weight than I do as a modern American guy. When we're not farming, we read or listen to music or knit. We don't have TV or radio, but we do have a very decent library with books and records. Fun times. The record collection has everything from Mahler symphonies to the Beatles. And I'm always borrowing records to listen to in my room. The one real problem with this place is that once you're here, you don't want to leave. Or you're afraid to leave. As long as we're here, we feel calm and peaceful. Our deformities seem natural. We think we've recovered, but we can never be sure that the outside world will accept us in the same way. My doctor says it's time I began having contact with outside people, meaning normal people in the normal world. When he says that, the only face I see is yours. Romantic. To tell the truth, I don't want to see my parents. They're too upset over me, and seeing them puts me in a bad mood. Plus, there are things I have to explain to you. I'm not sure I can explain them very well, but they're important things I can't go on avoiding any longer. Still, you shouldn't feel that I'm a burden to you. The one thing I don't want to be is a burden to anyone. I can sense the good feelings you have for me. They make me very happy. All I'm doing in this letter is trying to convey that happiness to you. Those good feelings of yours are probably just what I need at this point in my life. Please forgive me if I've any written anything I've written here upsets you. As I said before, I am a far more flawed human being than you realize. I sometimes wonder, if you and I had met under absolutely ordinary circumstances, and if we had liked each other, what would have happened? If I had been normal and you had been normal, which of course you are, and there had been no Kizuki, that's their mutual friend that was her boyfriend, what would have happened? Of course, this if is way too big. I'm trying hard at least to be fair and honest. It's all I can do at this point. I hope to convey some small part of my feelings to you this way. Unlike an ordinary hospital, this place has free visiting hours. As long as you call the day before, you can come any time. You can even eat with me, and there's a place for you to stay. Please come and see me sometime when it's convenient for you. I look forward to seeing you. I'm enclosing a map. Sorry this turned into such a long letter. Man, that would be... Can you imagine that? Like, it's this girl who was... She was his friend. She was his friend's girlfriend. Um, then his friend killed himself and then they kind of gradually got closer after that and then she suddenly ran away to this insane asylum and he hasn't heard from her for a long time and you suddenly get a letter like this that would be some really heavy emotions what would you do like, go see her i guess or would you just would you not want to i think i would feel like I don't want to, but I have to. I would feel obligated to, but it would be very painful to see her, I think, after all that. I read Naoko's letter all the way through, and then I read it again. After that, I went downstairs, bought a Coke from the vending machine, and drank it while reading the letter one more time. I put the seven pages of writing paper back into the envelope and laid it on my desk. My name and address had been written on the pink envelope in perfect tiny characters that were just a bit too precisely formed for those of a girl. Hmm? Don't girls have better handwriting? 
I sat at my desk, studying the envelope. The return address on the back said, Ami Hostel. An odd name, I thought about it for a few minutes, concluding that the Ami must be from the French word for friend. After putting the letter away in my desk drawer, I changed clothes and went out. I was afraid if I stayed near the letter, I would end up reading it 10, 20, who knew how many times. I walked the streets of Tokyo on Sunday without a destination in mind, as I had always done with Naoko. I wandered from one street to the next, recalling her letter line by line and mulling each sentence over as best I could. When the sun went down, I returned to the dorm and made a long-distance call to the Ami hostel. A woman receptionist answered and asked my business. I asked if it might be possible for me to visit Naoko in the following afternoon. I left my name, and she said I should call back in half an hour. The same woman answered when I called back after dinner. It would indeed be possible for me to see Naoko, she said. I thanked her, hung up, and put a change of clothes and a few toiletries in my rucksack. Then I picked up the magic mountain again, reading and sipping brandy and waiting to get sleepy. Even so, I didn't fall asleep until after one o'clock in the morning. This guy's, uh, this guy's sleep schedule is going to be messed up with basically staying out all night before and drinking and drinking some more. And he's messed up from emotions and stuff. He, he describes everything so matter-of-factly, like this happened and this happened and this happened. Just He doesn't really react to anything. He just sort of says what happened. But you can sort of get the, the feeling about this character that he is feeling some strong emotions. He's just not saying them. At least that's, that's how I interpret it anyway. Where should I go? Next chapter? I think I'll stop here. Well... I'll do one more. <laughs> one more chapter. As soon as I woke at seven o'clock on Monday morning, I washed my face, shaved, and went straight to the dorm head's room without eating breakfast to say that I was going to be gone for two days hiking in the hills. He was used to my taking short trips when I had free time and reacted without surprise. Again, this is such a weird incongruity between this person sometimes dealing with these really heavy adult situations and then sometimes like oh gotta get permission from my dorm head to go out for two days i wonder if it's still like that i i stayed at a, a dormitory once in japan that had really strict rules like that it wasn't quite that strict but it was pretty strict still so maybe it's still like that I took a crowded commuter train to Tokyo Station and bought a bullet train ticket to Kyoto, literally jumping onto the first Hikari Express to pull out. I made do with coffee and a sandwich for breakfast and dozed for an hour. I arrived in Kyoto for a few minutes before 11. Following Naoko's instructions, I took a city bus to a small terminal serving the northern suburbs. The next bus to my destination would not be leaving until 11.35, I was told. And the, bus, and the trip would take a little over an hour. I bought a ticket and went to a bookshop across the street for a map. Back in the waiting room, I studied the map to see if I could find exactly where the Ami Hostel was located. It turned out to be, a much, to be much further into the mountains than I had imagined. The bus would have to cross several hills in its trek north, then turn around where the canyon road dead-ended and return to the city. My stop would be just before the end of the line. There was a footpath near the bus stop according to Naoko, and if I followed it for 20 minutes, I would reach Ami Hostel. No wonder if it was such a quiet place, if it was that deep in the mountains. It's interesting that there's, you can go to this, I don't know what to call it, sanitarium, I guess, deep in the mountains, but there's still like a city bus line that takes you there. The bus pulled out with about 20 passengers aboard, following the Kamo River through the north end of Kyoto. The tightly packed city streets gave way to more sparse housing than field and vacant land. Black tile roofs and vinyl-sided greenhouses caught the early autumn sun and sent it back with a glare. 
When the bus entered the canyon, the driver began hauling the steering wheel this way and that to follow the twists and curves of the road, and I began to feel queasy. I could still taste my morning coffee. By the time the number of curves began to decrease to the point where I felt some relief, the bus plunged into a chilling cedar forest. The trees might have been old growth, the way they towered over the road, blocking out the sun and covering everything in gloomy shadows. The breeze following into the bus's open windows turned suddenly cold, its dampness sharp against the skin. The valley road hugged the riverbank, continuing so long through the trees it began to seem as if the whole world had been buried forever in cedar forest, at which point the forest ended and we came to an open basin surrounded by mountain peaks. Broad green farmland spread out in all directions, and the river by the road looked bright and clear. A single thread of white smoke rose in the distance. Some houses had laundry drying in the sun, and dogs were howling. Each farm had firewood out front piled up to the eaves, usually with a cat resting somewhere on the pile. The road was lined with such houses for a time, but I saw not a single person. The scenery repeated this pattern any number of times. The bus would enter Cedar Forest, come out to a village, then go back into forest. It would stop at a village to let people off, but no one ever got on. Forty minutes after leaving the city, the bus reached a mountain pass with a wide open view. The driver stopped the bus and announced that we would be waiting there for five or six minutes. People could step down from the bus if they wished. There were only four passengers left now, including me. We all got out and stretched or smoked and looked down at the panorama of Kyoto far below. The driver went off to one side for a pee. The sun-tanned man in his early fifties, who had boarded the bus with a big rope-tied cardboard carton, asked me if I was going out to hike in the mountains. I said yes, to keep things simple. <laughs> it's like something I would do. I just, I don't want to explain, so I'll just lie. <laughs> not even doing anything bad. I just don't want to talk to you. Eventually, another bus came climbing up from the other side of the pass and stopped next to ours. The driver got out, had a short talk with our driver, and the two men climbed back into their buses. Bus driver buddies. The four of us returned to our seats, and the buses pulled out in opposite directions. It was not immediately clear to me why our bus had had to wait for the other one, but a short way down to the other side of the mountain, the road narrowed suddenly. Two big buses could never have passed each other on the road, and in fact, passing ordinary cars coming in the other direction required a good deal of maneuvering, with one or the other vehicle having to back up and squeeze into the overhang of a curve. It's dangerous. The villages along the road were far smaller now, and the level areas under cultivation were even narrower. The mountain was steeper, its walls pressed closer to the bus windows. They seemed to have, have just as many dogs as the other places, though, and the arrival of the bus would set off a howling competition. Sounds really remote. At the stop where I got off, there was nothing. No houses, no fields, just the bus stop sign, a little stream and the trail opening. I slung my rucksack over my shoulder and started up the track. The stream ran along the left side of the trail, and a forest of deciduous trees lined the right. I hope he got off in the right place. Imagine if he had just if he got off at the wrong stop and he's just in the middle of nowhere. I had been climbing the gentle slope for some fifteen minutes when I came to a road leading into the woods on the right, the opening barely wide enough to accommodate a car. Ami, hostile, private, no trespassing, read the sign by the road. Sharply etched tire tracks ran up the road through the trees. The occasional flapping of wings echoed in the woods. The sound came through with strange clarity, as if amplified above the other voices of the forest. Once from far away, I heard what might have been a rifle shot, but it was a small and muffled sound, as though it had passed through several filters. Beyond the woods, I came to a white stone wall. It was no higher than my own height, and, lacking additional barriers on top, would have been easy for me to scale. The black iron gate looked sturdy enough, but it was wide open, and there was no one manning the guardhouse. Another sign like the last one stood by the gate. On the hostel, private, no trespassing. A few clues suggested that the guard had been there until some moments before. The ashtray held three butt, butt ends. Butt ends. A teacup stood there half empty. A transistor radio sat on a shelf, and the clock on the wall ticked off the time with a dry sound. I waited for a while for the person to come back, but when that showed no sign of happening, I gave a few pushes to something that looked as if it might be a bell. 
The area just inside the gate was a car park. In it stood a minibus, a four-wheel drive land cruiser, and a dark blue Volvo. The car park could have held 30 cars, but only three were parked there now. Two or three minutes went by, and then a gatekeeper in a navy blue uniform came down the forest road on a yellow bicycle. He was a tall man in his early 60s with receding hair. He, locked, he leaned the yellow bike against the guardhouse and said, I'm very sorry to have kept you waiting, though he didn't sound sorry at all. The number 32 was painted in white on the mud, bike's mudguard. When I gave him my name, he picked up the phone and repeated it twice to someone on the other end, replied, Yes, uh-huh, I see, to the other person, then hung up. Go to the main building, please, and ask for Dr. Ishida, he said to me. Take this road to the trees to a roundabout, then take your second left, got that? Your second left from the roundabout. You'll see an old house. Turn right and go through another bunch of trees to a concrete building. That's the main building. It's easy, just watch for the signs. Doesn't sound easy at all. I took the second left from the roundabout, as instructed. And where that path ended, I came to an interesting old building that obviously had been someone's country house once. It had a manicured garden with well-shaped rocks and a stone lantern. It must have been a country estate. Turning right through the trees, I saw a three-story concrete building. It stood in a hollowed-out area, and so there was nothing overwhelming about its three stories. It was simple in design and gave a strong impression of cleanliness. The entrance was on the second floor. I climbed the stairs and went in through a big glass door to find a young woman in a red dress at the reception desk. I gave her my name and said I had been instructed to ask for Dr. Ishida. She smiled and gestured towards a brown sofa, suggesting in low tones that I wait there for a doctor to come. Then she dialed a number. I lowered my rucksack from my bank, sank down into the deep cushions of the sofa, and spotted, surveyed the place. It was a clean, pleasant lobby with ornamental potted plants, tasteful abstract paintings, and a polished floor. As I waited, I kept my eyes on the floor's reflection of my shoes. At one point, the reception assured me, the doctor will be here soon, I nodded. What an incredibly quiet place. There were no sounds of any kind. It was as though everyone were taking a siesta. People, animals, insects, plants must all be sound asleep, I thought. It was such a quiet afternoon. Before long, though, I heard the soft padding of rubber soles, and a mature, bristly-haired woman appeared. She swept across the lobby, sat down next to me, crossed her legs, and took my hand. Instead of just shaking it, she turned my hand over, examining it front and back. You haven't played a musical instrument, at least not for some years now, have you, were the first words out of her mouth. It's a way to greet someone. No, I said, taking it back. You're right. I can tell from your hands, she said with a smile. There was something mis almost mysterious about this woman. Her face had lots of wrinkles. These were the first thing to catch your eyes, but they didn't make her look old. Instead, they emphasized a certain youthfulness in her that transcended age. The wrinkles belonged where they were, as if they had been part of her face since birth. When she smiled, the wrinkles smiled with her. When she frowned, the wrinkles frowned too. When she was neither smiling nor frowning, the wrinkles lay scattered over her face in a strangely warm, ironic way. Here was a woman in her late thirties, oh, late thirties, so old, who seemed not merely a nice person, but whose niceness drew you to her. I liked her from the moment I saw her. Wildly chopped, her hair stuck out in patches and the fringe lay crooked against her forehead, but the style suited her perfectly. She wore a blue work shirt over her a white t-shirt, baggy cream-colored cotton trousers, and tennis shoes. Long and slim, she had almost no breasts. Her lips moved constantly to one side in a kind of ironic curl, and the wrinkles at the corners of her eyes moved in tiny twitches. She looked like a kindly, skilled, but somewhat world-weary female carpenter. I guess I can kind of imagine that. I don't, I don't think I've ever personally met a world-weary female carpenter, but I think I can imagine that. Chin drawn in and lips curled, she took some time to look me over from head to toe. I imagined that any minute now she was going to whip out her tape measure and start measuring me everywhere. <laughs> everywhere? Penis inspection day? Sorry. Can you play an instrument, she asked. Sorry, no, I said. Too bad, she said. It would have been fun. I suppose so, I said. Why all this talk about musical instruments? She took a pack of seven stars from her breast pocket, 
put one between her lips, lit it with a lighter, and began puffing away with obvious pleasure. It crossed my mind that I should tell you about this place, Mr. Watanabe, was it? Before you see Naoko. So I arranged for the two of us to have this little talk. Ami Hostel is kind of unusual. You might find it a little confusing without any background knowledge. I'm right, aren't I, in supposing that you don't know anything about this place? Almost nothing. Well then, first of all, she began, then snapped her fingers. Come to think of it, have you had lunch? I bet you're hungry. You're right, I am. Come with me, then. We can talk over food in the dining hall. Lunchtime is over, but if you go now, they can still make us something. Wasn't he supposed to have lunch with Naoko? Wasn't that the whole point of coming here? Whatever. She took the lead, hurrying down a corridor and a flight of stairs to the first floor dining hall. It was a large room with enough space for perhaps 200 people, but only half was in use. The other half partitioned off like a resort hotel out of season. The day's menu items listed up potato stew with noodles, salad, orange juice, and bread. The vegetables turned out to be as delicious as Nalko had said in her letter, and I finished everything on my plate. You obviously enjoy your food, said my female companion. Hey, you call you calling him fat. It's wonderful, I said. Plus, I've hardly eaten anything all day. You're welcome to mine if you like. I'm full. Here, go ahead. I will if you really don't want it. I've got a small stomach. It doesn't hold much. I make up for what I'm missing with cigarettes. Oh, she lit another seven star. <laughs> you know, for someone who's a doctor, she doesn't seem to lead a very healthy lifestyle. Oh, by the way, you can call me Reiko. Everybody does. Reiko seemed to derive great pleasure from watching me while I ate the potato stew she had hardly touched and munched on her bread. Is that what she's into? <laughs> Sorry, I keep... <laughs> can't take this making fun of this. I, shouldn't... I don't know which parts I should take seriously, how seriously I should be taking this. Are you Naoko's doctor? I asked. Me, Naoko's doctor? She screwed up her face. What makes you think I'm a doctor? You told me to ask for Dr. Ishida. Plus, I just imagine this woman wearing a white coat. Oh, I get it. No, 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 I teach music here. It's kind of therapy for some patients, so for fun they call me the music doctor, and sometimes Dr. Ishida. But I'm just another patient. I've been here seven years. I work as a music teacher and help out in the office, so it's hard to tell anymore whether I'm a patient or staff. Didn't Naoko tell you about me? I shook my head. That's strange, said Reiko. I'm Naoko's roommate. I like living with her. We talk about all kinds of things, including you. What about me? Hmm. This seems a bit uh, suspicious. Well, first I have to tell you about this place, said Reiko, ignoring my question. The first thing you ought to know is that this is no ordinary hospital. It's not so much for treatment as for convalescence. We do have a few doctors, of course, and they give hourly sessions, but they're just checking people's conditions, taking their temperature and things like that, not administering treatments as in an ordinary hospital. There are no bars on the windows here, and the gate is always wide open. People enter and leave voluntarily. You have to be suited to that kind of convalescence to be admitted here in the first place. In some cases, people who need specialized therapy end up going to a specialized hospital. Okay so far? I think so, I asked. But what does this convalescence consist of? Can you give me a concrete example? Reiko exhaled a cloud of smoke and drank what was left of her orange juice. Just living here is the convalescence, she asked. A regular routine, exercise, isolation from the outside world, clean air, quiet. Our farmland makes us practically self-sufficient. There's no TV or radio. No TV or radio. I wonder if they have Twitter. We're like one of those commune places you hear so much about. Of course, one thing different from a commune is that it costs a bundle to get in here. A bundle? Well, it's not ridiculously expensive, but it's not cheap. Just look at these facilities. We've got a lot of land here, a few patients, a big staff, and in my case, I've been here a long time. True, I'm almost staff myself, so I get concessions, but still. Now, how about a cup of coffee? I said I'd like some. She stubbed out her cigarette and went over to the counter where she poured two cups of coffee from a warm pot and brought them back to where we were sitting. She put sugar in hers, stirred it, frowned, and took a sip. You know, she said, the sanitarium is not a profit-making enterprise, so it can keep going without charging as much as it might have to otherwise. The land was a donation. They created a corporation for the purpose. The whole place used to be the donor's summer home about 20 years ago. You saw the old house, I'm sure. 
I said I had. This used to be the only building on the property. It's where they did group therapy. That's how it all got started. The donor's son had a tendency towards mental illness, and a specialist recommended group therapy for him. The doctor's theory was that if you could have a group of patients living out in the country, helping each other with physical labor and have a doctor for advice and checkups, you could cure certain kinds of sickness. They tried it, and the operation grew and was incorporated, and they put more land under cultivation and put up the main building five years ago. Meaning, the therapy worked. Well, not for everything. Lots of people don't get better, but also a lot of people who couldn't be helped anywhere else managed to complete recovery here. The best thing about this place is the way everybody helps everybody else. Oh, this place sounds really nice, like almost suspiciously nice. Everybody knows they're flawed in some way, so they try to help each other. Other places don't work that way, unfortunately. Doctors are doctors and patients are patients. The patient looks for help to the doctor and the doctor gives his help to the patient. Here, though, we all help each other. We're all each other's mirrors and the doctors are part of us. They watch us from the sidelines and they slip in to help us if they see we need something. But it sometimes happens that we help them. Sometimes we're better at something than they are. For example, I'm teaching one doctor to play the piano and another patient is teaching a nurse French. That kind of thing. Patients with problems like ours are often blessed with special abilities. So everyone here is equal, patients, staff, and you. You're one of us while you're in here, so I help you and you help me. It's really nice. Reiko smiled, gently flexing every wrinkle on her face. Remember, she's in her 30s. I don't think she has that many wrinkles, but whatever. You help Naoko, and Naoko helps you. What should I do then? Give me, give me an example. First, you decide that you want to help and that you need to be helped by the other person. Then you are totally honest. You will not lie. You will not gloss over anything. You will not cover up anything that might prove embarrassing to you. That's all there is to it. That's hard. That's a lot harder than it sounds, I think, to be that total, to be that honest and open and not hide anything. That's harder than it sounds, in my opinion. I'll try, I said, but tell me, Reiko, why have you been in here for seven years? Talking with you like this, I can't believe there's anything wrong with you. Not while the sun's up, she said with a somber look. Is she a werewolf? But when night comes, I start drooling and rolling on the floor. Really? Don't be ridiculous. I'm kidding, she said, shaking her head with a look of disgust. I'm completely well, for now at least. I stay here because I enjoy helping other people get well. Teaching music, growing vegetables, I like it here. We're all more or less friends. Compared to that, what if I got in the outside world? I'm 38, going on 40. I'm not like Naoko. There's nobody waiting for me to get out, no family to take me back. I don't have any work to speak of, and almost no friends. And after seven years, I don't know what's going on out there. Oh, I'll read a paper in the library every once in a while, but I haven't set foot outside this property all that time. I wouldn't know what to do if I left. No. That's, uh... That's a little sad. But maybe a new world would open up for you, I asked. It's worth a try, don't you think? Hmm, you may be right, she said, turning her cigarette lighter over and over in her hand. But I've got my own set of problems. I can tell you all about them sometime, if you like. I nodded in response. And Naoko, I, I said, is she any better? Hmm, we think so. She was pretty confused at first. We had her, our doubts for a while. She's calmed down now and improved to the point where she's able to express herself verbally. She's definitely heading in the right direction, but she should have received treatment a lot earlier. Her symptoms were already apparent from the time that boyfriend of hers, Kizuki, killed himself. Her family should have seen it, and she herself should have realized that something was wrong. Of course, things weren't right at home, either. None of that was obvious. <laughs> they weren't? I shot back. You didn't know? Reiko seemed more surprised than I was. I shook my head. Yeah, he didn't know anything. I'd better let Naoko tell you about that herself. She's ready for some honest talk with you. Reiko gave her coffee another stir and took a sip. There's one more thing you need to know, she said. According to the rules here, you and Naoko will not be allowed to be alone together. Visitors can't be alone with patients. An observer always has to be present, which in this case means me. I'm sorry, but you'll just have to put up with me, okay? What is this, kindergarten? Okay, I said with a smile. But still, she said, the two of you can talk about anything you'd like. Forget I'm there. I know pretty much everything there is to know about you and Naoko. Everything? 
pretty much. We have these group sessions, you know, so we learn a lot about each other. Plus, Naoko and I talk about everything. We don't have too many session secrets here. I looked at Reiko as I drank my coffee. To tell you the truth, I said, I'm confused. I still don't know whether what I did to Naoko in Tokyo was the right thing to do or not. By, by what he did to her, he means sleeping with her. <laughs> I've been thinking about it this whole time, and I still don't know. And neither do I, said Reiko, and neither does Naoko. That's something the two of you will have to figure it out for decide for yourselves. See what I mean? Whatever happened, the two of you can turn it in the right direction, if you can reach some kind of mutual understanding. Maybe, once you've got that taken care of, you can go back and think about what, what, whether what happened was the right thing or not. What do you say? I nodded. Sorry, I have to interject. I don't think life works like that. It, you do these things, it's not like there's a clear right or wrong. It's just stuff happens sometimes. You can't, you can't put everything into this neat category of good, good decision, bad decision. It's just another thing that happened. Anyway, I nodded. I think the three of us can help each other. You and Nako and I, if we really want to, and if we're really honest. It can be incredibly effective when three people work at it like that. How long can you stay? Well, I'd like to get back to Tokyo by early evening the day after tomorrow. I have to work, and I've got a German exam on Thursday. Good, she said, so you can stay with us. That way it won't cost you anything, and you can talk without having to worry about the time. With us? I asked. Naoka and me, of course. Huh? <gasps> so you can sleep with both of them. We have a separate bedroom, and there's a sofa bed in the living room, so you'll be able to sleep fine. Don't worry. Do they allow that? I asked. Can a male visitor stay in a woman's room? I don't suppose you're going to come in and rape us in the middle of the night. Don't be silly. Hmm. So there's no problem, then. Stay in our place, and we can have some nice long talks. That would be the best thing. Then we can really understand each other. And I can play my guitar for you. I'm pretty good, you know. Are you sure I'm not going to be in the way? Reiko put her third seven-star between her lips and lit it after screwing up the corner of her mouth. Naoka and I have already discussed this. The two of us together are giving you a personal invitation to stay with us. Don't you think you should just politely accept? Of course, I'll be glad to. That's so nice. That's, that's a, I can't I, I want to make fun of it, but I, that's honestly genuinely really sweet of her to say something like that. Reiko deepened the wrinkles at the corner of her eyes and looked at me for a time. You've got this funny way of talking, she said. Don't tell me you're trying to imitate that boy in Catcher of the Rye. Is that like a 1960s style chinibyo? No way, I said with a smile. Reiko smiled too, cigarette in mouth. You are a good person, though. I can tell that much from looking at you. I can tell these things after seven years of watching people come and go here. There are people who can open their hearts and people who can't. You're one of the ones who can. Or more precisely, you can if you want to. What happens when people open their hearts? Reiko clasped her hands together on the table, a cigarette dangling from her lips. She was enjoying this. They get better, she said. Ash dropped under the table, but she seemed not to notice. Reiko and I left the main building, crossed a hill, and passed by a pool, some tennis courts, and a basketball court. Nice place. Two men, one thin and middle-aged, the other young and fat, were on a tennis court. Both used their rackets well, but to me the game they were playing could not have been tennis. It seemed as if the two of them had a special interest in the bounce of tennis balls and were doing research in that area. They slammed the ball back and forth with a kind of strange concentration. Both were drenched in sweat. The young man in the end of the court, close to us, noticed Draco and came over. They exchanged a few words, smiling. Near the court, a man with no expression on his face was using a large mower to cut the grass. Moving on, we came to a patch of woods where some 15 or 20 neat little cottages stood at some distance from each other. The same kind of yellow bike the gatekeeper had been riding was parked at the entrance to almost every house. Staff members and their families live here, asked, said Reiko. We have just about everything we need without going to the city, she said as we walked along. Where food is concerned, as I said before, we're practically self-sufficient. We get eggs from our own chicken coop. We have books and records and exercise facilities, our own convenience store, and every week barbers and beauticians come to visit. We even have films at weekends. Anything special, we can ask a staff member to buy for us in town. Clothing we order from catalogs. Living here is no problem. Man, sounds really nice. I'm going to go live in a sanatorium like this. That sounds awesome. But you can't go into town? 
No, that we can't do. Of course, if there's something special, like we have to go to the dentist or something, that's another matter. But as a rule, we can't go into town. Each person is completely free to leave this place, but once you've left, you can't come back. You burn your bridges. You can't go off for a couple of days in town and expect to come back. It only stands to reason, though. Everybody would be coming and going. Still kind of sounds like a prison, but very nice prison. Beyond the trees, we came to a gentle slope along which, at irregular intervals, was a row of two-story wooden houses that had something odd about them. What made them look strange, it's hard to say, but that was the first thing I felt when I saw them. My reaction was a lot like what we feel when we see unreality painted in a pleasant way. It occurred to me that this is what you might get if Walt Disney did an animated version of a Munch painting. All the houses were exactly the same shape and color, nearly cubical, in perfect left-to-right symmetry, with big front doors and lots of windows. The road twisted its way among them like an artificial practice course of a driving school. There was a well-manicured flowering shrubbery in front of every house. The place was deserted, and curtains covered all the windows. This is called Area C. Women live here. Us. There are ten houses, each containing four units, two people per unit. That's 80 people altogether, but at the moment there are only 32 of us. Quiet, isn't it? Well, there's nobody here right now, Reiko said. I've been giving special permission to move around freely like this, but everyone else is off pursuing their individual schedules. Some are exercising, some are gardening, some are in group therapy, some are out gathering wild plants. Each person makes up his or her own schedule. Let's see. What's Naoko doing now? I think she was supposed to be working on new paint and wallpaper. I forget. There are a few jobs like that that don't finish till five. This place sounds so nice. <laughs> Better than the than normal life. Reiko walked into the building marked C7, climbed the stairs at the far end of the hallway, and opened the door on the right, which was unlocked. She showed me around the flat, a pleasant, if plain, four-room unit. Living room, bedroom, kitchen, and bath. Had no extra furniture or unnecessary decoration, but neither was the place severe. There was nothing special about it, but being there was kind of like being with Reiko. You could relax and let the tension leave your body. The living room had a sofa, a table, and a rocking chair. Another table stood in the kitchen. Both tables had large ashtrays on them. The bedroom had two beds, two desks, and a closet. A small white table stood between the beds with a reading lamp on top and a paperback turned face down. The kitchen had a small electric cooker that matched the fridge and was equipped for simple cooking. No bath, just a shower, but it's pretty impressive, wouldn't you say? Bath and laundry facilities are communal. It's almost too impressive. My dorm room has a ceiling and a window. <laughs> ah, but you haven't seen the winters here, said Reiko, touching my back to guide me to the sofa and sitting down next to me. They're long and harsh, nothing but snow and snow and more snow everywhere you look. It gets damp and chills you to the bone. I spend the winter shoveling snow. Mostly you stay inside where it's warm and listen to music, or talk it, or knit. If you didn't have this much space, you'd suffocate. You'll see if you come here in the winter. Reiko gave a deep sigh, as if picturing wintertime, then folded her hands on her knees. Yeah, winter sucks. Oh, I don't like winter either. This will be your bed, she said, patting the sofa. We'll sleep in the bedroom, and you'll sleep here. You should be all right, don't you think? I'm sure I'll be fine. So that settles it. We'll be back around five. Naoko and I both have things to do until then. Do you mind staying here alone? Not at all. I'll study my German. Good diligent student. When Reiko left, I stretched out on the sofa and closed my eyes. I lay there steeping myself in the silence when, out of nowhere, I thought of the time Kizuki and I went on that motorbike ride. It had been autumn, too, I realized. Autumn, how many years ago? Yes, four. I recalled the smell of Kizuki's leather jacket and the racket made by the red Yamaha 125cc bike. We went to a spot far down the coast and came back the same evening exhausted. Nothing special happened on the way, but I remember it well. The sharp autumn wind moaned in my ears, and looking up at the sky, my hands clutched in Kizuki's jacket. I felt as if I might be swept into outer space. I lay there for a long time, letting my mind wander from one memory to another. For some strange reason, Lying in this room seemed to bring back old memories that I had rarely, if ever, recalled before. Some of them were pleasant, but others carried a trace of sadness. And how long did this go on? I was so immersed in that torrent of memory, and it was a torrent, like a spring gushing out of the rocks, 
that I failed to notice Naoko quietly open the door and come in. I opened my eyes, and there she was. I raised my head and looked into her eyes for a time. She was sitting on the arm of the sofa, looking at me. At first I thought she might be an image spun into existence by my own memories, but it was the real Naoko. Sleeping, she whispered. No, I said, just thinking. I sat up and asked, How are you? I'm good, she said with a little smile, like a pale, distant scene. I don't have much time, though. I'm not supposed to be here now. I just got away for a minute, and I have to go back right away. Don't you hate my hair? Not at all, I said. It's cute. Her hair was in a simple schoolgirl style, with one side held in place with a hair slide the way she used to have in, in the old days. It suited her very well, as if she had always worn it that way. She looked like one of the beautiful little girls you see in woodblock prints from the Middle Ages. Hmm. Not sure what that means. It's such a pain. I have Reiko cut it for me. Do you really think it's cute? Really? My mother hates it. She opened the hair slide, let the hair hang down, smoothed it with her fingers, and closed the hair slide again. It was shaped like a butterfly. I wanted to see you alone before the three of us get together. Not that I had anything special to say. I just wanted to see your face and get used to having you here. Otherwise, I'd have trouble getting to know you again. I'm so bad with people. Well, I asked, is it working? A little, she said, touching her hair slide again. But time's up. I've got to go. I nodded. Toru, she began, I really want to thank you for coming to see me. It makes you me very happy. But if being here is any kind of burden to you, you shouldn't hesitate to tell me so. This is a special place, and it has a special system, and some people can't get into it. So if you feel like that, please be honest and let me know. I won't be crushed. We're honest with each other here. We tell each other all kinds of things with complete honesty. Man, they, she keeps saying honesty. It makes me suspicious. I'll tell you, I said. I'll be honest. Naoko sat down and leaned against me on the sofa. When I put my arm around her, she rested her head on my shoulder and pressed her face to my neck. She stayed like that for a time, almost as if she were taking my temperature. Holding her, I felt warm in the chest. After a short while, she stood up without saying a word and went out through the door as quietly as she had come in. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit tired. I think, uh... Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause here. I'm gonna stop here. I, my voice is getting quite tired of reading. And... Just the general heaviness of the story also kind of tires me out. I really like it, but it's also just emotionally exhausting. It's like every single thing that happens is heavy. There's almost no light parts. Sorry again for starting in the middle of the book, but I think it's the sort of story where that doesn't matter as much. It's not really about the plot. It's about the characters and the dialogue and the scenes between them. To me, it's funny how some of this seems extremely Japanese and some of parts seem like it could be in America and some parts seem very 1960s and some parts seem very modern. Yeah, I guess I've run out of things to say about it. Well, I'll just stop this here. Maybe I'll come back to it later. Thanks for listening.